This is so exciting for me today. I'm sure many of you feel like this. Um, over the last four decades, uh, Jane Campion has made so many beautifully enduring short films. She's made eight feature films for the cinema, many works for television, including the l recent long form Top of the Lake. Um, and through all of that work, she's really inspired and energized all of us and many colleagues in the industry as well as audiences. And if the measure of great art is the ability to make us see the world differently, and also the measure of a great artist is to expand what we think of as the possible, then Jane is absolutely this for me, and I'm sure she will be for you guys too. There, she's been such an intrepid explorer of female subjectivity, and she's also really been at the forefront of demonstrating that real culture change can happen in the industry. We've been so lucky to welcome her to the festival. She, clo she opened the 2003 festival within the cut, and in 2009, we screened Bright Star as the centerpiece gala. And tonight, her beautiful The Power of the Dog screens as our American Express gala. Put your hands together for Jane Campion. Such a pleasure to have you here. And Such a lovely, warm welcome. Thank yeah. you. Can you, is this? On? Yeah, it's on. You can yeah. sit down. Yeah. Cool. So, so I mentioned in the intro, I don't know if you could hear it, that I think lots of people in the industry have been inspired. Uh, like, odd, we've got public audience, we have industry here. So many people have been inspired to join the industry by seeing your work. So many women have been energized about cinema through seeing your work. My first time seeing Jane's work was a VHS, a very much rented, battered copy of these incredible short films that you made that still stick with me as some of the best short films I've ever seen. It was so amazing that that was the beginning of your career. And I wanted to ask, what was that first thing that you saw as the filmmaker that you that sort of electrified you and made you think, I, could, I wanna do this? Yeah. Oh, well, I remember seeing um, a Boone Well film when I was probably too young to see it. Um, <laughs> it was one with Catherine Deneuve in it. <laughs> yeah. um, what's it called? In Australia? Yeah, Australia. Australia. yeah. Thank you. And um, my mum talked me, and I just remember knowing it was sort of like beyond my understanding, but feeling so excited that something you know was like that. You know that. Um, the sexual life of adults was weird, you know, <laughs> and so intriguing and so interesting. And then later, uh, you know, Boonwell made me feel like, oh, you know, adults that can be as free and crazy as him, that's really amazing. You know, so he was like one, a big passion, a first early passion of mine. And then I remember my dad, on the other hand, taking me to see performance uh, <laughs> when I was also a teenager. And I really... Really loved that. That's uh, Nick Rogue, absolutely. Um, who also is a filmmaker that I th I think I really love the intimacy of his work and the sort of energy of it. Incredible. Yeah, he's incredible. And um, so those are my sort of two. And then I just remember seeing Apocalypse Now quite a bit later. But I was just like, it, it was so amazing to experience a film like that and to see that. You know, the first time I understood that war was just a lot of nonsense that, you know. Mm. It, I mean, you were fed propaganda about the Vietnam War and here you were just seeing that it was just so untrue. And, uh, yeah. and I mean, I, I, you know, so it sort of had a, a really eye-opening purpose to it and the whole world that Coppola described and, you know, I just loved it so much. Jane, so we're going to do today a little sort of tour. It's not, you know, it's it's not a sort of life in pictures, but wanted to sort of look back at some of your films as a way to move to power of the do the power of the dog. And I wanted to just start and remind everyone, probably my own bias. I adore these short films, and if you haven't seen them before, I'd suggest you go see them. But I wanted to start with a little clip from Peel. Um, and the, the clip that we're going to see is after it's a, about a family who are a mother, father and a child who are having an argument in a car. It's very tense, a lot of unspoken tension that suggests long term, ongoing, bubbling fight. Father, a child has just thrown some orange peels out the window and the father pulls up on the side of the road and forces the child to go pick up the orange peels. And that's where where we start.
so unsurprisingly, it's a, the, the shorts are really terrific, and that won the Palm, the short Palm d'Or in 1986. I wanted to ask two sort of a joint question, and one is, I know in 1986 that you ended up screening not one, but three other films in Cannes Film Festival, oh. and that really started a long relationship that you've had with the festival. How did that come about? How did you end up with four films in the Cannes Film Festival? Okay, so um, I made the um, three short films at the um, Australian Film and Television and Radio School um, while I was there. and. I had that ambition because actually I went to art school first of all and um, started realising that, you know, despite the fact that I thought only geniuses made movies, um, <laughs> um, I had be I'd become obsessed really with film and um, I started making films there and, you know, just like... I used to come to festivals like this anyway, and I just like watch everything. And then I noticed they had some short films in front of the features, and I thought, oh, I could make one of those. I never thought like a feature. Like, Are you kidding me? Women don't make them. That's uh, <laughs> you could make the little things beforehand, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't have presumed. Um, so I had the ambition, you know, while I was at art school to try and make a short film, and I made a, a little film. Um, it was animated about two single beds um, having a love affair. <laughs> and weirdly enough, the film was lost. You know, like once we shot it, it, it never came back. So anyway, I made some other things at art school. But I, I had a year out in the world where I realised um, I didn't know anybody in the industry and I, I really was desperate to try and, you know, see if I could be a filmmaker. But how to begin was really a difficult deed and I made some mistakes and, you know, I tried to get a grant from the Australian Film Commission and it really fucked that up. It was sort of my own fault, but... <laughs> um, yeah, and, but I sort of knew I had. And anyway, I started to realise, like, oh, my God, they're never going to give me any money. That's the end of my career, you know. It's like, and then I had uh, the option of going to the film school and I went, okay, here we go, this is, this is my chance. And even though I thought at my age of 27 at the time, I'm like, oh, I was too old. <laughs> like, and my parents were going like, what about a job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing because at the film school, they paid you $75 a week and it was free education. I mean, and this is actually, you probably don't know this, but this is why I'm trying to start a pop-up film school, I'm going to stuff a pop-up film school in New Zealand which doesn't have a film school, just to try and recreate a situation where young people or, or not even that young, whoever um, deserves that opportunity can spend a year creating and finding their voices as filmmakers yeah. um, and that they will be paid too and um, yeah, I'll work for free. They'll be paid. That's right. That's fantastic. <laughs> and, yeah, it is fantastic and I really love it because I was given that opportunity and I don't want everything in the world to be depleted when it comes to what's available for the next generation. Anyway, I went to the film school and I had a year out and I was aware this was my opportunity. If I was going to have a chance, I needed to make stuff and I needed to make probably three short films because one would not be enough. Um, and so I sort of made that my ambition that during the time I was there to try and make three films. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to be good enough either. You know, like you don't know when you're beginning whether you've, you know, got the capacity or not. Um, but, you know, you, you got the passion. <laughs> um, and then you, you're at school with 75 other people who think they're amazing, you know. <laughs> They didn't get it, three films into the can. No, they didn't. Them. But you know, it's the, they all felt they had were there to try and find out, or you know. So I'm thinking like, okay, well, you know, I'm sure they are. We're all great in our own lunchbox, but you know, we have to figure it out. And um, I, I actually looked at, started quite systematically going through all the short films that were already at the film school with anything that had won any prizes. <laughs> just to see if I could see what the standard was, you know, um, because I wasn't even really sure. And surely enough, everything that had seemed to have won something did have some quality that you would say is um, strengthening or strong. And I thought, okay, well, that's a sort of bar for me. Yeah. 
And then um, Can you I articulate what that quality was. Well, it was very different for each film. Like um, I saw a Gillian Gilli Armstrong's film, short film. I can't remember the name of it now, but it 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 was really um, connecting and um, professional. And um, I think it was about making buttons or something, factory work. Yeah, of of, a, of some young women, and uh, it just felt. Um, that, you know, like it was quite perfect in its own way. So um, in the first year, you don't really get a budget to do anything, but they have a special project fund where um, you can apply to do it. And I applied um, to do it for this film, Peel. Um, and I had these friends who are all redheaded, <laughs> who were very fiery, actually. Um, but they were brother and sister, and um, um, Tim's little boy, Ben. Uh, and uh, I really love redheads. So. <laughs> yeah, I, th I was thinking that, that one of the reasons I wanted to show that yeah. clip is there are such interest. It's such a great short film, but there are also visual m uh, motifs so yes. that appear in lots of your films. Yeah, like the well, just the oranges in yeah. them. And, and, and anyway, the story that came about was like a little story, and I always find this incredibly helpful, that happened to me and my family um, when my sister and I were in the car with my brother, and he... Um, was throwing actually tissues out the window um, and we were going, ah, no, stop him, you know. <laughs> and my dad, he, who's like a really nice-natured person, but every now and again he always thinks, you know, okay, this has gone too far, this is an exercise in discipline, you know. This is too much. So we stopped the car and he told my brother that he had to go back and pick up the tissues, which seemed like <laughs> a very difficult task because they're blown all over the motorway. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, it happened a little bit like that. He went back and we were very satisfied. My sister and I is going to get told off, you know. <laughs> but then when they came back from their little journey, because then my father got worried that maybe something would happen, he'd run out on the road and get a tissue. And, and so when they came back, it was all like they were so jolly together. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we were hoping for. <laughs> Bad. And um, so it was that was the inspiration, but... And as I say, I always really like to have some inspiration in whatever story I'm telling that, that kind of grounds it to my own experience. Like, oh, I know that feeling. I know these things that I'm trying to create. You know, it's not just in my head. It's like a body memory. Um, so when I went to tell the story, I swapped out the um, tissues for orange because I thought it would you know, have a more visual um, yeah, similarity to their redheadedness. And... So we, so we started off making I mean, I learned everything you can about making films on this one short film, and I ended, even ended up in hospital in um, intensive care from the stress. Making, <laughs> work, working yourself too hard, yeah. I mean, I know, and I thought, oh, my God, how is someone who can't even make like a seven-minute or nine-minute film <laughs> going to have a career? Like, oh, my God, I hope nobody finds out. <laughs> But uh, I had, I got asthma and, you know, I was just like working to three in the morning in order to sort of work out the shots and I didn't understand about like preparation, you know, like you can start a few, you know, months before and get it done. So I really did learn how to preserve your physical strength and, um, you know, like stamina, like on a, you know, nine week shoot or a 12 week shoot. You know, that's a long time to be day after day focusing and knowing, you know, what to do every day. And that little film taught me how. Plus, you know, like when the film got put together and everyone at the school, apart from Sally Bongers and myself, thought it was like a heap of rubbish <laughs> and don't bother finishing it. It was actually, you know, so they saw like a long, I guess it was a big lesson again. Like they saw a long version of it. I know you're probably thinking, like, we're talking about one short film now. How are we going to get through the whole filmography? <laughs> but this is so much like my whole filmography. <laughs> um, and then so you had that feeling of being a complete failure, you know, which was kind of interesting. And also, you know, everyone's like, oh, Jane's working on that failure in that room, you know. <laughs> um, so it was like low expectations and I edited it myself as well and learned so many things like, you know, like you see those car flashes in it. I learned that you could you could just go and film a whole lot of car flashes and then you could edit any which way you like and that they also that the sound of the cars 
you know, vroom, vroom, and vroom, vroom. It became like a kind of um, heartbeat of the story. And so it became very particular. Yeah. Um, and I was using a lot of my sort of art school knowledge about how to, you know, economy of vision and um, trying to find a few motifs and then keeping repeating them for strength. So in the end, I guess, even it's got my anthropology in it because I do a sort of family tree at the beginning of the film, you know. Yeah, um, the triangle. The triangle of who they all are, you know, in terms of their um, relationship to each other, which they always do in anthropology. <laughs> so um, the film became, um, yes, much stronger. You know, and by the time I finished it, the people that told me don't bother finishing it, you know, I showed it to them. And they didn't even recognise it. But I also learnt that, you know, it's one thing for me to see something in my short film. But you actually um, have to reduce it, reduce it, move everything out of it that you know is telling another message. And you, you taught yourself that. As yeah. Well, actually, other film students did yeah. too. Like they'd come in and they'd say, oh, "What do you think?" And they'd say, "Well, you know, you don't have to ha always cut to people that are saying the thing. You can just run it over someone's back, you know." And I'd go, oh, "Thank you." you know? I mean, I was just learning, okay. Uh, but it was really vital information from really, really clever other students. So finally that film was finished and, you know, the, I made a couple of other ones and I, you know, left the school and, you know, I did quite well within the Sydney Film Festival. I think I won the Ruben Mamoulian for, award for also um, Girls' Own Story, yeah. which is the main prize for the shorts, although I didn't win the best fiction, someone else won that, anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, Sally Potter gave it to me. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to Sally. Yeah, she was on the international jury. Um, and then maybe like a year went by and I made a, um, another film, which was the fourth one, called Two Friends at the ABC for Jan Chapman, which was like a 75-minute film. Um, so I got a bit of stamina by then. <laughs> and, uh, and then one morning I got a call from uh, this very excited French guy and um, out of the blue at like 7 a.m. and he said, oh, I'm very sorry to ring you so early in the morning, but um, I'm ringing now because I don't know if you know who I am. I am Pierre Rizion and I am a um, scout for the uh, Camp Film Festival and I had discovered deep in front of Francis Ford Coppola in Apocalypse Now and I was going, oh, Apocalypse <laughs> Now. <laughs> he said, I, I just want your permission to take the films and to put them to maybe we make a selection of them. Um, for the festival is, may I have your permission? And I said, yeah, that, that'd be great. I mean, it was out of the blue, okay? I didn't even know he was looking at them. And apparently he, he went as a scout to look at films in Australia. And when he went there, he didn't like any of the short films that they were screening. Um, no, it's not the short films, the long films, the feature lengths. And he, he had a lot more time there. And he said, well, what else can you show me? Is there anybody interesting that's coming up or something like that? And they had um, copies of a few people's work, including mine. And he looked at one of them and he said, interesting, good, anything else? And they showed him another and he said, also interesting, okay. You know. <laughs> and then the third and he said, okay, let's call her. <laughs> and what happened was that in um, they couldn't decide which of the shorts they'd take, so they decided to make a program of them for on certain regard altogether. But I probably don't want to tell you this, but the screening was actually terrible. <laughs> like this is the <laughs> this is the world of film, you know. Always something goes right and many things go wrong. They can't like, tell. They have absolutely um, their standard of sc screening is absolutely famous in the world, like being amazing. However, when they had four films that they had to do, and like the subtitling on the films was done in a rush, so. On the two friends one, it had bled through to all of the other. It's, you know, it was like in the reel, and you couldn't really read it. <laughs> and then one of the for it your was first so terrible. Like the one film broke down twice. The sound wasn't there, and it was like, <laughs> and like so many people left the screening. <laughs> but then you won the prize. I, I did, yeah. but I just <laughs> want to go on about the bad bit first. <laughs> um, what happened was like there was seemed to be nobody left. I was like, this is the worst day of my whole life. I never, don't I ever come to Cannes, you know? Let me out of here. And I like, it was like really terrible. And I left the cinema, and Pierre came up to me and it's a great success. And I went, but they all left. And he said, no, no, the ones who remain are the important ones. <laughs> They're from Le Monde and Liberation, you know, and all, uh, you know, all these um, newspapers, and they love it. 
And so, you know, um, and they did. So, but, you know, like my experience of it was so hideous. <laughs> but the overall, um, I, I, I mean, what's left of it was that the films were discovered in um, Cannes and, um, yeah, I won the Palme d'Or for best short film. Well, so, yeah, that's... <laughs> And it, and it is a, a long relationship with mm. Cannes, including your first feature, Sweetie, which screened mm -hmm. in Cannes. But the first couple of features, I think also, like we start to see visual motifs and themes that are in your work. The first couple of films also really sort of define the subject space, I think, in a, such an interesting way. They're about women who are outsiders, who have difficult relationships with convention, like they don't behave the way they're expected to behave. Fortunately, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but were you were you really aware, like, this? Yeah. these women don't exist in cinema and I really want to tell their stories? Well, I think I didn't really think of it like that. I just thought, like, I'm always attracted to, you know, bad girls <laughs> of and literature as well, you know, like, if you, even if you think of um, Emily Bronte, Emily... Bronte was unsociable, she, incredibly unsociable. She wouldn't go out and yet here she is writing, I think, one of the sexiest men. I mean, she's no, undoubtedly a virgin. She only had the experience of a crazy brother, Branwell. And, and yet she wrote, I think, or created in her, from her imagination, one of the um, sexiest heroes of all time in, in, in Heathcliff and, um, you know, proper young woman, uh, woman just stunning everybody, including her family, who were sort of shocked that she could write such a um, crude or rude or rough or raw um, story. But, um, you know, we've got Emily Dickinson, who, who was a social outcast, really, who lived and worked in her room and lived a life of literature. And for me, a lot of these women shunned the world for a good reason. It was the world was not welcoming to them. And, um, yeah, I think that they created their own through their imagination, their, their, you know, a preferable world. Yeah. And it sounds like some, like, maybe literature was providing sort of examples of the types of women and sto female stories that you were more interested in than cinema was at the time. Is that fair to say? I think, it, I mean, yes, I, I, I'm always been a lover of the novel. Um, and, um, you know, even then for women to get their works Read, they often used a male pseudonym, as in um, George Eliot as well. Uh, and even Eleanor Frent Ferrante today doesn't use a male pseudonym, but she uses a pseudonym. And, um, you know, because she's, she's writing about female rage at a time when um, I think if she was, you know, doing interviews and all the rest of it, people would really attack her. Yeah. And I think it's so smart of her not to do that and to. Um, for whatever she's for whatever choice she's made, I don't know. If people here are familiar with uh, my brilliant friend and her work, but uh, you know, for me, like it's so exciting to see a woman's voice come out that actually um, not only introduces to the world but to women. You know that they're that they're allowed to be rageful, um, or to be angry, or to be you know to have ambivalent feelings towards their best friend. <laughs> you know, from jealousy to um, envy, anger, love, adoring, you know. And um, is that, I, I think even that, you know, like for a long time, it, you know, the patriarch has ruled um, so much stuff that, and they, they have a very particular vision of how women, how they want to see women, which is either the, um, the you know, like the mother type that, does everything for everyone and everywhere, or the mm -hmm. the, the, the no little uh, cute innocent. Mm. And you know, this is not a prescription for a life. You see it women, more in you know? si sibling relationships, maybe that sort of darkness and that tension, but not yeah. to other women. Yes, I mean, you know, there, there have been, you know, people like Lena Wertmiller, right, you know, writing and making films that I saw too that were really like Seven Beauties, which is fantastic. All those great crazy sisters. You gave an award to her. Didn't I did. You? I did. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, I love that movie. Um, but I did feel like the um, the understanding of who really women are in the world through cinema, you know, is kind of curated through men. And 
um, it's not to say that there aren't some really sensitive, great men, but they, you know, maybe there are a lot of sensitive, great women too. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wanted to I tell female stories. Yeah. And those first two stories are, um, you know, I know there were some people who were saying, oh, it's dirty, or like particularly with Sweetie. Sweetie, or, I mean, I know, like, um, yeah. And also, they were offended. A lot of the guy yeah. interviewers were incredibly offended that, that she's, they say, well, oh, your film is so disgusting, it's horrible. And I went, why? And she said, well, Sweetie was dirty. Because <laughs> she was, well, whatever. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, that really she had dirty underwear oh dear you know yeah exactly and also I think I think that the sanitary towel scene in Angel at my table aside from Carrie mm. might be the only the first place I'd ever seen sort of menstrual blood even you know physically shown in cinema I mean that just didn't exist that sort of real truthfulness mm. and for some people confrontational female physicality. I know. I remember when we were trying to get that funded, um, even women like working at the ABC said, oh, no one's going to want to watch something about a fuzzy redhead person with a period. <laughs> Thank goodness you didn't listen to all these people. So I, mean, you, listen, we don't, I don't know how come we didn't. Maybe it was the art school. Yeah. You know, that sort of brain thinking, which is a little bit more rebellious. Um, like I remember, you know, when I went to film school, the, the teachers there were like were really lame. And um, <laughs> I mean, they genuinely were like, and they never went to the movies. I didn't know what was going on. And I mean, I was really aware of that and that, I, you know, to listen to what they were saying, it's like rubbish, you know. <laughs> and um, so I didn't care what they thought at all. And yeah, so that, that gave me that strength, you know, because I think, you know, from art school background, that sort of we're, we're more critical thinking, you know. And you, with, with those films, and you've continued at times, you write alone when you're writing, but you also wrote those first two films with co-writers. What's the difference for you when you are collaborating on, on a script with somebody else and when you're Much doing more fun. Own? <laughs> <laughs> I think collaborating is... Um, sometimes I have to. I feel like I have to do a, a film by myself because it's so particular to me, you know, like maybe the piano or... I mean, I don't know... To adapt one with someone else would make much sense because you're almost collaborating with the writer, the original author, anyway. So um, I think, but if it's a very like Bright Star was a very personal story. I mean, I used Andrew Andrew Motion's biography, but it wasn't really the story of the film. But it was just you know like the backbone of it, the information, the um, research. But I do really love to um, collaborate, and I love work, color, collaborating with Jared Lee, who I did Passionless Moments with. And Top of the Lake. And Top of the Lake, yeah, and Sweetie, actually. Yeah. So, because um, he's just so funny, and, you know, a lot of the reason for making film is it's like really good fun <laughs> to be working with amazing people and, you know, supported to do your best together. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's extraordinary to, um, work with great collaborators with when you're in the writing process do you whether either alone or with someone else do you have to especially could it be the boss yeah <laughs> just say the collaboration <laughs> do you have to get to a point with your scripts um how do you know when you're like ready to turn them in to start shooting and start pre-production well it's a really good question um how do you know if your film's ready your script's ready how do you know your film's ready it's sort of like a, you, you get to a point when you can't think of anything else to do and then you start getting your collaborators um, on the project. Like it was with me, Tanya Segechi, and, um, and Tanya was like, a, you know, amazing help and support and even structuring, you know, like the current project, um, Power of the Dog, uh, doing that ad adaptation. And, um, and then you, you share it with them and her and also the um, Seesaw team who also, you know, my producing friends have done the Top of the Lake and um, I've been working with for about eight or ten years now. Um, and they tell you you haven't finished, <laughs> that there's a few things left to do and that it doesn't read as well as you think and then you try and do that work. You try and take that on and it's always irritating. But when you... <laughs> 
uh, but, you know, if you hear it and it rings a bell, I think you have to do it. You have to try and fix it. Um, and then, I mean, sometimes it gets undone. But I do think, if, like, if you, you basically need to, the script is usually used to finance the film. So it has to be readable in a way that people who are financing it are going to have faith in it and, and trust in it. And even if you juggle it around later, and also even, this is a little bit of a secret, but, um, you know, if you want a good actor to play in your film, you know, like you can pump up their role a bit. <laughs> and then strip it, and then strip it back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe if they do really well with it, but, you know, it, it is a thing to think about that, you know, you've got to attract the actors to, your, to the work, yeah. You mentioned Tanya, and I'm going to pick on her as well, because she said something, I think, that's so gets to the heart of one of the things that I think a lot of us probably love about your work, which is that you make the invisible visible. Um, and I wanted to show a clip, but then sort of ask you about, about that idea of like making, them, you know, making emotions visible and how you do that. And it's sort of, I feel like you couldn't, Led Zeppelin couldn't play a concert without showing, um, play, sing, doing Stairway to Heaven. So I wanna enjoy that beautiful moment in the piano, which is, I'm sure you've seen so many times, but it's just so gorgeous and it really does show that invisible interior life so well. Could we see the clip from the piano, please? Just so stunning and you know there's six words or seven words there but it just says, says so much how does a, a Sikh and and I think the, the power of the dog has so many of those moments as well how does a sequence like that how is it born in your mind is it in the script is it in the edit it's a little of everything yeah well I I think it happens to me when I'm considering how I'm going to direct it but it also is born out of the fact that you know, Holly doesn't talk. <laughs> Ada doesn't speak. Like once I got to the point of um, thinking, okay, um, thinking about the scenes in more detail. Like normally, when you have scenes, you know, you've got someone says something, the other one says something, and you've got intercutting going on. <laughs> but here, the, I suddenly went, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is going to be really difficult. <laughs> How am I going to organise this? You know, so it was like, um, I mean, in this scene, perhaps it's a little bit easier, but they, Holly with her eyes and, you know, Anna there, they just put pressure on him, you know? Like, they'd come to ask him to take him down to back to the piano and um, they just put that pressure on him. So, I, I mean, I learned, I guess, through the rehearsal, you know, a lot about what Holly and Anna could do together. Um, and I also learned, I mean, like, you know, like, when I was thinking about that problem, I was also, I remember I saw these two girls walking down the street, which was really a big hint, you know, like I was talking about, like having something embodied before. And they, they had, they were like two horses or two ponies and they just had this beautiful brown bounce, bouncing hair. And one was a lot shorter than the other. So it looked a bit like um, Ada and Flora and I went, that's it. They're kind of like little twins, like a little, you know, big me and mini me, you know, and and they just kind of do everything kind of together, like a harmony in a way. And um, so that was a sort of like a, you know, a really important insight for me about how I would film them, how I would work with them together and how that they would that would be a really powerful motif and that the motif would play into you know how together they were and then when um, they were separated with the love affair that well the first of all the earning the piano back um not so much a love affair but a um exploration of baines trying to work out what he wanted and you know i guess some sex something <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, the little girl had to be separated. So that, you know, to have them very close and seen together all the time and then split really, um, I think, helped that, that story element develop where, you know, the little girl who, was, who meant so much to her, who, who was her voice, who was everything, lost her importance, lost her place yeah. and was, you know, angry with her mother and wanted her to pay for it, but not as badly as Stuart made her pay for it. And... Seeing that now, you know, like even 20 or so, 30 years later, 
um, you still really feel like, oh, my God, you know, especially now with the Taliban and everything else, like this control of woman thing is so painful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems relevant even now is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And there's another clip I want to show in just a minute, but I just wanted to ask you that's really related to that. But I just wanted to ask you about... Um, it sounds like at the beginning when you said you were studying other people's short films and figuring out how they did it, that you're also like a real student of yeah. film as well. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, you know, I, you know, Francis Ford Coppola taught me filmmaking. He doesn't know it, but <laughs> I just like studied his films and pulled them apart and looked um, at his early work, including Rain People and things like that, and sort of watched how he built his... Um, classical style of working with actors because in my opinion his um, work with actors is, uh, is still amongst the best in the world that's ever been um, and you know because it's so relaxed and so embedded and he's you know he works with incredible actors and they are so casual but so true and real and um, you know yeah so I, I, st I tried to find out what he did and how he did it. I mean, he chose amazing people as well, but, you know, there was a work and expectations he had or what he was looking for that I wanted to understand more about. And yeah. when, you made, um, when you made Bright Star and you were interviewed about, um, uh, you know, writing, uh, making a film about a poet, you said you were trying to photograph sensations, which I also thought was sort of related, related to... To this as well too yeah i don't know why i said that <laughs> it's, very, it's very beautiful and i think describes yeah. the work could we actually watch um i want to watch the pre um well the pre-title sequence of portrait of a lady because okay. i think it does do this so beautifully um and it feels like visual poetry very much to me so could we see that please oh the female port the yeah, girl fe portraits yeah yes exactly yeah Another redhead. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much, and it is what you were. I think what you were talking about about that um, seeing the two girls walking along the street and the way they move together, and and also Holly um, uh, and Anna together as well, and two in that sort of space that women create together. That's something I think you do really well in in many of your films. Yeah, yeah. and is I just wanted to ask about this in particular. Um, when did a sequence like that come up? I mean, did you did you already know that you wanted to do that from the very, very start as you were writing the script, or is that later when you wanted to punctuate? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think I had it in the beginning. Um, I did that in the post um, section as a title sequence. Um, yeah, I think I was trying to balance um, um, the idea of portraiture of um, which I think. Portrait of a of a lady is about port. It's actually a portrait of you know a young woman, um, and uh, I mean it's a, one of my favorite books. And you know he, Isabel Archer, and he tells the story, really of the loss of her innocence. You know, and yeah, very painfully, and well. That 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 sequence also it's a very English story. I mean, she. I mean, it's a very European story, I guess. And but American also, story. Yeah, an American story, yeah. of course. <laughs> but it also, this pre t pre credit sequence connects to your um, your uh, own sort of film heritage as well. To was it really important to? Do you feel part of an Antipodean film heritage? And was that part of creating it? And the fact that it was New Zealand girls from New Zealand, right? These girls. Yes. The, at the, yes. At the I mean, I feel like they could have been from anywhere, but um, for me, where as I saw it, like girls from New Zealand and Australia, you know, like, of course the story is about Isabel Archer coming from America, which at that time was the sort of liberated mm -hmm. other colony, or not a colony, but um, country, and she was like a f had came like this amazingly fresh creature who wanted a career, who wanted to be important, who wanted to be um, invigorated by the world, not just to be a wife. 
um, in, in her mind that she wanted to understand things and that she wasn't going to settle for that. Um, just being a, you know, marriageable person. And I think coming from Australia and New Zealand, like we had become the equivalent really of what the American was then, so that the Australian and New Zealand young women were, like I said, intrepid travellers. Um, and, you know, America was now, I think, more um, establishment in, in a way. So I, yeah, um, I was just trying to remember, you know, what are those shoes that we all used to wear, those great big shoes? Those, um, huh? Yes, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Doc Martens. And I was just trying to get a feeling for who is Isabel Archer today, you know, if she was existing. And I was thinking, of course, she's a Doc Martin wearing, you know, <laughs> Australian, New Zealand or whatever, um, going out into the, the into, into, yeah. you know, into the world, try, you know, presenting herself as like, um, you know, androgynous, really. <laughs> yeah. And do you, just going back to the question of do you feel connected, do you feel like there's a sort of um, Antipodean tradition that you're part of and feel really connected? You went back for Top of the Lake, obviously, to make to make that. I, I mean, I, you know, you, you, of course you become a part of that tradition just by doing it, but um, I don't feel like, no, I didn't really feel like, oh, well, I'm part of the tradition. But I do feel like... An, excitement about making say top of the lake because it was made in the area where i've become like fall in love with in new zealand which is um at the top of the lake <laughs> near the rootburn walk and near queenstown and you know a really um remote um part of new zealand which i personally really love um and you know like a, a town that, you know where everybody sort of is kind of bloody-minded and has their own way of doing things and nobody can agree about anything you know like sometimes they try and have these like um let's imagine how our town can you know build or whatever like um discussions in Glenorchy where I'm from and you know like nobody can decide or agree about anything so they just like dissolve <laughs> yeah. and go away so but I did I do really love that um that that landscape that wilderness and um, that's where that story was invented. And, you know, so I have a loyalty to a space or a place and like a holy smoke and like, you know, the desert in um, Australia. Um, or Sweetie was just like our life there, you know, um, Jared and mine. And, you know, it was sort of based a little bit on his, the Sweetie characters was based on, on my sister, as I think my sister was worried people would think. <laughs> It's it dedicated was, to your sister, isn't it? It is. Yeah. She she helped me a lot yeah. at the time because I had a really terrible thing happen during the making of it. My mum tried to kill herself and she stepped in and came back from England and, you know, looked after her and so that I didn't have to stop filming. You know, it was towards the end of the film. But, you know, um, my poor mum has a big history of depression and, um, yeah, it's, you know, mental health illness is real. Um, can I ask, you talked a little about um, Coppola and how he works with actors. You also have such a gift with your actors, and in particular, um, I think, taking actors who we expect one thing of and then doing something very different with them. I mean, Nicole Kidman is a, you know, she'd done To Die For, and probably filming at the same time as mm -hmm. you were filming this. But it does seem, and with Benedict in your new film, you cast people who we expect something of and then find something sometimes quite dark and complex. How much are you interested in the sort of star persona that exists and the tension that you can create there? Well, I love working with actors. Um, my mum was an actress and my dad was a theatre director and uh, I used to love acting as well as a kid. Um, but, you know, with Nicole, like I remember meeting her when she was 14 and, you know, she was genuinely talented, always has been, always will be, you know, her... She's intelligent and kind of an amazing kid when she was young, of course, just continued to be extraordinary. But um, she reached out to me saying, oh, you know, can we talk? And I really want to do something with you. I feel like I've just, I'm, I'm going to give up acting altogether if I keep doing these handbag roles in America, you know, because I think she felt that being the wife of um, Tom Cruise, no, nobody knew that actually she had a capacity or a talent of her own. And I mean, I was aware of it 
but I did feel like she needed to do more um, deep work with like an acting coach or something and I suggested she do that. And um, she did work um, with an amazing acting coach that Harvey had introduced me to. And um, that was the work she did for, um, what was that one? The two? To Die For. To oh, Die For, yeah. yeah. And, um, and then I think, um, you know, she came onto my project also working with that same coach. And, and, did, and since then she's always used those, um, you know, like I think actors that sort of continually keep working, exploring their art, uh, you know, like are the ones that are lasting and are, are really brilliant. Um, unless they've just got some kind of weird talent where they, you know, like I guess Harrison Ford or something. Just like Harrison Does Ford. Harrison and, you know, Ford yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so amazing. We we'll want more of it. But yeah. Um, so, I mean, but I think that the hard thing for that film was that people didn't didn't want Nicole, you know, to do that. To do that role. They didn't know that she really has the depth she has. And they weren't ready to accept that yeah. at that point. You know, like they had a, you know, like a, I guess already listening to the idea that she was, you know, Tom Cruise's girlfriend, wife, whatever, and 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 not up to the role of a classical character, you know, playing Isabel Archer, which, you know, obviously I didn't agree with, you know. And what, so I agree and I think... It's like they put her down without even looking at the performance, yeah. And that's such a... I mean, even that yeah. opening... Yeah, I know, she's, she's so really beautiful. good, yeah. And what... So when you are working with an actor and you are going sometimes quite dark and compla complex places with them, how you've got... It sounds, seems like you have a real relationship of trust with your actors and... Every director wants to look for that, you know, and to create that environment on the set and, you know, with the actor so that, um, you know, because what you want where actors need to go is to places they don't really know, you know. It's like you are entering a mystery in a way and uh, I think there's a woman um, who I really love the way she talks about it anyway. Um, it's Clarissa Pinkola Estes who uh, wrote the book uh, Women That Run With Wolves. Um, I don't know how many of you know about her, but she talks about this sort of stuff so beautifully. She talks about you know, the energy of creativity um, that's actually maybe sexually born originally yeah. um, um, out of lust, but it's also that same lust energy can be used creatively and that you can enter kind of these deeper rivers of... Um, which are basically creativity and that it's sort of like invisible but visible once you get to understand it. I mean, most authors or writers or anybody working continually in the creative field have, uh, have developed that connection that is beyond the brain that, you know, if you set yourself up for it, it just starts to fulfil you and be there for you. And so I'm always looking for ways for the actors to... Uh, connect to that um, pool, that energy that's always there for them and that, you know, is going to be better than anything they could think up with their brain. Um, so that's what I really do believe that, it's, you know, it's part instinct but it's also an even more interesting sort of psychic energy that can be um, created and, yes, I mean, many actors already know about that stuff or are already intuitively working with it, you know, but like, say, for Benedict... And myself on the uh, the power of the dog. That's a, that was a big step for us. Like we really believed that for both of us that we wanted to take a psyche journey towards our characters and the project because it's a complex piece, and um, we knew that if we didn't do that, we wouldn't be fulfilling the brief really. And you know, so what I love in actors, their courage, and Benedict's a very courageous um, and fearless actor. You know, he will go there. I mean, a lot of people are really frightened of like trying something that they haven't tried before it might put them off their pace or something like that but you know like you know my job is in a way is is just reaching out and to say like try it you know I've tried it I think it's good I think if you work with this person you'll get an interesting results so give it a go and um, you know like to actually take them beyond their comfort zone to maybe into new work or new areas but you can't do this with everybody if you have to be willing yeah um, so you know you have to sort of you know, like working with someone like Benedict, it's like he's such an extraordinary talent anyway. He's got this 
capacity to, you know, he's got so much charisma and energy and kind of, you know, masculine stuff that we saw, I guess, with Sherlock Holmes and things like that. But also he's got this, um, which you don't see so much in that, this absolute capacity to go deep inside and just open out and be um, really emotionally vulnerable. Um, I think we, I'm going to give the projectionist a chance to get to the next clip because I'd like to show um, the teaser that we have for The Power of the Dog. But okay. while they're queuing that up, I just, I wanted to show something from In the Cut because I think it's such an interesting film and it was so, I feel, really ahead of its time and it's being re re appraised right now, rediscovered. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether, just talking about actors still, wh whether you thought part of that reaction to it was people weren't ready to see Meg Ryan in that role, it's quite dark, or even ready to see sort of female sexuality in the way you that have you... have to, yeah, remember that almost all the, like I would say 95% or maybe 90% of all the um, writers about film are men, right? Wouldn't you say? And um, I really felt that at the time that they, that, that secret knowledge about women that I think um, in the cut introduces was something very confronting for them and they really screamed about it, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> at the time, which wasn't much fun because they really fucked it up. And it, well, so many women are rediscovering it now and you're, are you doing, are you have a Criterion release of the film? A re I don't think of in the cut, but um, is it? I don't know. I thought I read that, but it could, could be wrong. It's the piano we're doing there. But um, yes, we have had a screening like... Um, in London, actually, there was um, some young people put on a screening. And in fact, one of our yeah. programmers now was the person who, who put that on. Yeah, well and it was really wood. fun and it was really full cinema and we talked about the film and together and I think Dion Beebe even turned up there who shot it. Um, so it was really fun and it, it is really, um, yeah, it does something to heal the uh, pain of the original <laughs> release. <laughs> well, and of course, Sandra Hebron opened the London yes. Film Festival in 2003. And then there was the Parkinson interview. I didn't read that, but let's, let's not go there. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what you're talking about, male film critics. Yeah. But should we, see, um, should we see the gorgeous teaser trailer, please, from The Power of the Dog? Yeah, this is not really showing a sensitive side, but yeah, dominance, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's, you know, the same kind of advice I gave myself, which is, um, you know, like try and discover what you love and what's good and why you love it and then you try and do it yourself <laughs> is, is the way to do it and not to put things out until they're right, you know, like to keep going back and to fixing it and to, you know, to be kind of, I mean, it's painful, but it's the learning experience of like, um, you, and I think some of that, exploration of you know till you can find out how to you know do it really well is 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 what the learning is about and what will certainly be happening at my pop-up amazing <laughs> um which is really just about you know like i learned that you know your friends can tell you you just say be, be brutal tell me what you like what you don't like and and you have to try and build muscles to hear that feedback because um feedback is brutal it's like you know every time you hear it you go like oh i'm never going to be good enough you know um, but you, you can have that attitude of like, um, is, I mean, I mean they, it's help. Feedback is help. But, um, you know, you can only take so much at a time. So you've got to <laughs> you, tr trust, pace yourself. Trust yeah. your collaborators, obviously, as well, too. Well, you know, like very few people tell you the truth. That's one of the big problems. <laughs> like, you know, because they just can't be bothered with, you know, the, what's going to happen if you, they really tell you the truth because you're going to look at like, <laughs> cry and be upset and and yet perhaps your collaborators will because they are going to you know they're going to go down too if, if, <laughs> <laughs> if it's not well done you know so it's a it's that really difficult thing you know you need the truth but I mean it's like you need inspiration to do really well and you need um you know to learn and and there's a little bit of fear and pain involved in that but you've got to have the people that love you and support you and a little bit like seeing you into a future that you're not quite yet there yet with 
um, like Tanya always does. <laughs> you know, like someone having someone that that love is so important to this process, yet you still have to have the um, determination to do better, to do better, to do better, to fix it. You know, and it's quite a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a really weird and kind of like sour quality to the whole process. But it's so it's sweet and sour, I guess, is the thing. It's so important to accept that sourness. And um, I think, you know, have it as part of the process. It's just it. You know, I don't know many filmmakers that get carried away by themselves because they just know how many times they've failed, you know, in whatever project they're doing. They fixed it, they fixed it, they fixed it, they fixed it, they fixed it. And, and you know, so, I, you know, I've learned to be, a, you know, a great failure. <laughs> Well, how, <laughs> I think it's incredibly generous and really, really lucky that you're going to be working with young filmmakers because that's so, probably not that young. So important. Well, in <laughs> other filmmakers, yeah. it's, it's such a collaborative process. But I just want to thank you so much for allowing oh, us to you, screen Trish. The Power of the Dog as our. I'm so excited to be screening it. Yeah, that's so. Amazing. And the people, what's the capacity of the um, cinemas it's, now? It's big. It's two thousand seats. So oh wow! And they're all. Uh, hopefully, who, how many people are seeing it tonight? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so we'll keep the party going. And um, thank you so much, Jane Campion, yeah. for being with us.